the confirmation of charges hearing in the second Kenya case, the case of the prosecutor versus Francis Kirimi Mutaura, Uhuru Mugai Kenyatta, and Muhammad Hussein Ali, opened on 21st of September and lasted until the 5th of October 2011. This is the second case in the Kenya situation held before pretrial chamber two of the International Criminal Court, composed of Judge Ekaterina Trendafilova, presiding judge, Judge Hans Peter Kaul, and Judge Kunuter Fuse. Mr. Mutaura and Mr. Kenyatta are allegedly criminally responsible as indirect co-perpetrators for the crimes against humanity of murder, forcible transfer of population, rape, persecution, and other inhuman acts. Mr. Ali has allegedly otherwise contributed to the commission of the above-mentioned crimes against humanity alleged to have been committed in Kenya in the context of the 2007-2008 post-election violence. The opening statements were delivered by all parties and participants, starting with the Office of the Prosecutor. The evidence to be presented by the prosecution will establish substantial grounds to believe that Mr. Francis Kirimi Muthaura, Uhuru Mugai Kenyatta, and Mohammed Hussein Ali are individually responsible for the crimes mentioned and as a consequence, the pretrial chamber should commit them for trial. The perpetrators used the local inhabitants in Nakuru and Aibasha to identify and target the ODM supporters. They went from house to house and door to door attacking the civilians, dragging them from their homes or their business premises, showing a systematic and well-organized organized operation. The attackers followed an organizational policy, identifying the perceived supporters of the ODM when they were fleeing, intercepting them in their flight, cutting them with machetes, and clubbing them. They commit rape, including gang rape of the mothers, wife, and daughters of perceived ODM supporters, and forcibly circumcised the men. These are the crimes that tomorrow will provide in detail the evidence that proved them. Madam President, your honors, the defense teams are inviting the chamber to embark in a sort of in-depth scrutiny of the credibility and reliability of individual pieces of prosecution evidence. That is not possible. The confirmation hearing is neither a mini trial nor a trial before the trial. As your honor has said as a single judge in the Kenya one case, the presentation of witness evidence by way of written statement is to be considered the norm, given the nature and purpose of the hearing. Therefore, the prosecution should admit that the fair assessment of the credibility and reliability of its witness can only be made after the credibility, reliability, and consistency of the evidence has been fully explored through questioning and cross-examination of the witness at trial. The credibility of the witness, of the prosecution witnesses, should be discussed at trial. What matters at this stage, at the confirmation of charges, is that the different pieces of evidence are consistently proving each element of the crimes. And on this, the prosecution witness corroborate each other and the, their information is independently corroborated by evidence produced by different reports and the National Security Intelligence Service reports. An intervention of the International Criminal Court is required to end the use of violence to gain or to maintain political power in Kenya. For these reasons, the prosecutor consider that the evidence proved are in accordance with the standards, the individual responsibility of the suspect, and they should be committed to trial. Thank you very much, Madam President, for your attention. Pre-trial chamber two authorized 233 victims to participate in the confirmation of charges hearing and related proceedings. 
They were presented by Maury Sanya, common legal representative. Victims were granted the following rights to be exercised by their common legal representative. To attend all public sessions, to make brief opening and closing statements, to have access to the public report of the case, including public evidence, to be notified of all public decisions and filings, and to present their views and concerns when their personal interests are affected. Other parties to the case, in particular the defense, they have the benefit of having their clients present with them in court. I do not. It's quite obvious that the 233 victims that I represent are not here today. They are to be found in various provinces in Kenya, thousands of miles away from the seat of the court. Most of my victims are to be found in the Rift Valley province of Kenya, as well as the Nyanza province of Kenya. Nonetheless, Madam President, Your Honors, those victims are here today in spirit. These victims, I have found, are astute. They are informed and they are engaged in the process. They are determined to see that justice is done. All of them have had their lives changed forever. And they will not be silenced during the course of these proceedings. Many of them want the opportunity to restart their lives, lives that have been turned upside down and completely destroyed. Many of them are looking for restoration. They want things to revert back to how they were. A male victim that met with me was asked what he wanted me to tell the court, and he said, quote, I just want the court to know I want my life back. The three suspects in this case are represented by the defense teams headed by Principal Counsel Karim Khan, Stephen Kay, and Evans Munari. Because it, it points in only one direction, and that is that the charges cannot be confirmed. Your Honours, every aspect of this case has been dissected. Prosecution witnesses who say that they're in, uh, say individuals are in Nairobi, they have proved to be elsewhere. Individuals who are said to be in office, we have proved documents that they have retired. Members that are said to be Mungiki, we have other evidence that they're not members of Mungiki. People that say that they're scared of Mungiki, we have evidence from them asking for the Mungikis to make them Facebook friends. The prosecution say that on the 3rd of January, Ambassador Mathara had a critical meeting. You have the NSAC minutes that prove on the, on the 3rd of January, he was in Harambe House at NSAC with all the individuals that the ambassador mentioned earlier. Your Honor, the last point is you have evidence that in the afternoon, he was there on video with the President of the Republic who gave a speech. And Your Honor, we didn't stop there. You have the telephone records of the ambassador that show who he called. And um, uh, General Ali was not called at that time. Your Honor, the burden is not on us. It is on the prosecution. But we have done what the prosecution has failed to do. And we say with great sincerity that questions have been raised in this case that go beyond the central issue which is whether or not the charges should be confirmed. But on that critical issue for the ambassador, we say, Your Honours, reviewing all the evidence that will be put forward over the next few days, will come to only one conclusion, and that is to dismiss these charges, not to confirm these charges. And Your Honours, we have every trust that you will do so. I'm grateful for your time. These proceedings arise from a course of conduct connected and commenced by senior ODM politicians and activists before the December 2007 elections in Kenya, in which they were determined to cry that if they lost the election, then it was stolen from them. Their cries not to be made by a plea to the judicial process for an orderly and proper challenge in the courts 
to the validity of the electoral results? No. Their cries were to be to their supporters as a call to arms to attack their political opponents and to create such civil disturbance and violence so as to make Kenya ungovernable and cause the elected government to surrender and enable them to take power. But this technique of challenging the democratic process by such means is not new. It was witnessed in Ukraine in 2004 when another orange democratic movement carried out precisely the same strategy. That was a, this was a copycat production that was organized with foreign assistance, not for the benefit of Kenya, but for the benefit of those senior ODM politicians. <laughs> na bwana DC kuhakikisha ya kwamba kila shamba kila shamba hapa iko na askari ya kutosha ndio wale ambao wataona ya kwamba watataka kubaki waweze kubaki wakiwa na usalama the transcript is at evd 00391 ringtail 0116 it says this no one is being chased away because the one who would like to remain and I am telling the truth, and Mr. District Commissioner, ensure that every farm, every farm has enough police officers so that those who feel that they want to remain are able to remain safely. These are not the words of a man taking revenge against people in order to retain power. So how has it come about that he has been brought here? There has been a clear political decision by the prosecution to bring three people from each side and put them on trial, to make a case fit against both sides, to construct a case without a proper investigation of the evidence and with complete disregard of the facts. The period following the 2007 Kenyan presidential election was a horrific, brutal, and a very disturbing time. Communities were torn apart by violent attacks. Families were shattered by inexplicable killings. The time of post-election violence in Kenya was a time of unimaginable loss. And that, your honors, is beyond dispute. General Mohammed Hussein Ali, a dedicated public servant with a lifelong career of devoted commitment to his country and to his fellow men felt that loss keenly. During the post-election violence, he worked tirelessly to protect the Kenyan people and to enforce the rule of law. General Ali pushed his officers and himself to prevent violent attacks in towns like Naivasha and Nakuru. Facing unimaginable odds, and when the situation in the Rift, in the Rift Valley was at, at, at its worst, General Ali personally directed his officers to maintain law and order. He beefed up security patrols with a view to avert attacks and avoid violence. He ordered supervisors to ensure that officers were encouraged and appreciated for their work. And this is in all the evidence that we show during our submissions. I submit to your honors at the end of the day, for legal reasons, sufficiency, admissibility, but even for the factual reasons, you will come to only one conclusion and one, only one conclusion only, that these charges would not be confirmed. But in a more general language and in a more conversational language, I hope you hearken back when you're in your deliberations to the question that I asked at the outset, which is why is General Ali here? Why? Because there is no reason for it no reason whatsoever, and the prosecution is not ever going to be able to establish that reason. One of the suspects in this case, Francis Kirimi Mutaura, also addressed the court. For me to be presented in this court as a monster by information 
gathered, I would say from the bush, I really feel very sad. Have my family here. You can see them. They have not slept well for the last one year since the prosecutor pronounced me as a suspect. Ironically, any time the prosecutor came to Nairobi, we sat across the table. He always passed in, in front of my office. I escorted him to his car. He never at any time mentioned to me I was a suspect. I would have given him answers to the issues that he thinks he has, which actually are nothing. At the end of it, it's not Muthaura who is going to be in this court tried. It's the prosecutor who is going to be tried. In the course of 12 days of hearings, the Office of the Prosecutor and the defense teams of the three suspects were presenting evidences to the pretrial chamber two judges. Francis Kirimi Mutaura's defense team called two live witnesses, Lucas Kate Mwanza, district commissioner in Naivasha at the time of post-election violence, and Mwangi Tuita, permanent secretary at the Kenyan Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uhuru Mugai Kenyatta, one of the suspects in this case, testified on the eighth day of the hearing. Everything that we did at that time was to first and foremost assist those who had been victimized, the secondly was when, as a result of the growing anger amongst uh, supporters uh, of the PNU, we went out to calm them and to prevent them from doing anything that is retaliatory in nature and actually appeal to them to allow the government and to allow proper procedure to get justice for them, which we were assuring them would eventually happen. Little did I know that that would mean myself being brought to the International Criminal Court. Uhuru Kenyatta's defense team called one live witness, Louis Nagai, MP from the Kikuyu constituency. Muhammad Hussein Ali's defense team called two live witnesses, Peter Otiano, branch secretary of the Kenyan Plantation and Agricultural Worker Union based in Naivasha, and Muhammad Amin, who at the time of the post-election violence served as a Provincial Criminal Investigation Division Officer for the Rift Valley. On the 12th day of the hearing, trial lawyer Adesola de Boyage delivered closing arguments for the Office of the Prosecutor. Your Honours, this confirmation hearing has clearly demonstrated that there are substantial grounds to believe that the three suspects are criminally responsible for the crimes charged and that this case should proceed to trial. The evidence presented by the prosecution is credible and compelling when viewed in totality. It is corroborated not only by multiple and varied external sources, but also by admissions in the evidence of the defense. It reflects the reality of events and is largely consistent with the statements provided by victim participants in this case. Madam President, Your Honors, this case must be looked at from the perspective of a state where powerful individuals wielding enormous political and financial clout can distort a state structure by adopting and implementing policies which lead to violence and impunity. On the basis that the evidence presented is sufficient to establish substantial grounds to believe that the suspects committed the crimes charged, the prosecution asks this chamber to confirm the charges and to commit Francis Muthaura, Uhuru Kenyatta, and Hussein Ali to trial. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. De Bourgeois. Maurice Sanya, common legal representative of the 233 victims authorized to participate in the proceedings, 
said that the victims made meaningful contributions to the proceedings. The prosecution's responsibility is to tie the links together. But in doing so, and this is where the victims come in, context matters. Your honors have to look at the context that the evidence develops as to what happened in Kenya. One of the things your honors could look at is the nature of the victim participants in this case. Of the 233 that I represent, 218 are Luos, 14 are Luyas, and there's one Kalenjin. So what does that say? That demonstrates to us that the predominant and majority of the victims were Luos. They were targeted. That's what it shows. When you look at the nature of the attacks in Naivasha and Nakuru, you look at the scope, you look at the magnitude of those attacks, and then you look at who was targeted, the victims. Our submission is that it demonstrates that this was planned, it was organized, it was coordinated, and it was systematic. The result element shows it, who suffered what, when, and how. I haven't seen the evidence, all of it. I have heard things in the court for the first time, given our inaccess to confidential inter-parties disclosures. But the victim's position is that that standard has been satisfied and the case should be committed to trial. The victims in this case have additional concerns that I wish to bring to your Honor's attention. They are concerned about what you would call the foot soldiers, the actual direct perpetrators of the crime. They still see some of these people from time to time. They recognize some of these people. Most of these persons have not been prosecuted and it is a source of concern to the victims. I mentioned when I gave the opening statement that the victims have security concerns. Those concerns remain. The security concerns prevail for many different reasons. But two are particularly important at this point. The first is this case the prominence of the suspects in this case. Many of the victims are still in camps for displaced persons. They feel that the level of security that they will enjoy is directly related to the outcome of this proceeding and also to the outcome of the proceeding in the Kenya one case, the Ruto et al case. And the second source of concern is the upcoming elections in 2012 in Kenya. Now, there may not be much that your honors can do about the 2012 elections and the prospects for violence during those elections. But with, with respect to this case, if possible, the victims have expressed a hope, a wish, a desire that Whatever decisions your honors arrive at in this case and in the first case, in the Ruta et al case, that your honors issue those decisions simultaneously because they affect different communities. And regardless of which way your honors decide, it would be helpful to them if everything were resolved at the same time. I've been asked to convey this to your honors. The victims are also concerned about fatigue and the length of the criminal process. Many of them are reminded about their victimization each time the case is back in the news. And it's going on now two and a half years since the events happened. So that is a source of concern for the victims. Karim Khan, counsel for Francis Kirimi Mutaura, 
said that the confirmation of charges hearing is an important mechanism to protect the rights of the defense and shield suspects from unfounded charges. Your Honours, the Wacky Commission came up with, and I will conclude, uh, with important caveats. And I would refer you to EVD PT OTP uh, 0004 at 0391 and EVD PT OTP 0004 at 0828. And the Commission said that the information, the evidence gathered so far, is not in our assessment sufficient to meet the threshold of proof beyond reasonable doubt. We believe, however, they continue, that the Commission's evidence forms a firm basis for further investigations of alleged perpetrators, especially concerning those who bore the greatest responsibility to post-election violence. Uh, Your Honours, they continued at page 454 that a flawed investigative process is the very antithesis of a successful prosecution. In other words, the, quali the quality of investigation affects the outcome of both the prosecution and adjudication of the matter. Your Honours, the prosecution have patently failed to investigate. This really is a critical failure in the case. They have not met their important and significant burden of showing sufficient grounds to establish substantial grounds to believe that the charges are made out. And Your Honours, it's our respectful submission and for reasons that we will uh, deal with in due course in our written brief, that this case compels to but one conclusion, and that is that the charges should not be confirmed. Stephen Kay, counsel for Uhuru Mugai Kenyatta, stressed that the confirmation of charges proceedings are an opportunity for the defence to present its evidence to the judges. This case has great significance. Court knows that. The whole of Kenya knows that. Uh, this case carries with it a, a, a significance that goes beyond the charges here. Uh, and that is why we have asked for a very careful and rigorous examination. Because in our submission, uh, what has been put before you is not well researched and investigated by the prosecutor uh, and doesn't deserve the status of being confirmed uh, and you as judges will be aware, as I know, of your responsibilities uh, in relation uh, to that. Um, Mr Kenyatta took the first opportunity to give evidence before you. He gave his account and then he was available for cross-examination. This moved this case beyond, they're not testimonies that you've been given by the prosecutor, they are statements, they are not testimonies, they are statements. They are reports, they are documents, they contain many accounts. This moved this case uh, into the realm of directly being able to establish the case that you have. In the cross-examination of Mr Kenyatta, what smoking guns were put before this court concerning his alleged acts and conduct? That hour that we watched, that hour that he was available for questioning, was a demonstrable hour to show what you had, why you had it, and what you could do with it. We were prepared to face that hour. 
you will have seen, I've never objected concerning time or issues such as that in this case. If, if prosecution had wanted to go on, they could have. In fact, they went short. They couldn't even fill that hour. It was an empty hour. Gregory Kiho and Ian Monari delivered closing arguments for Mohammed Hussein Ali's defense. We have spoken to this chamber for more than two weeks, trying to beseech you, trying to tell you, and show you by way of evidence that what happened in Kenya is something that we all regret as Kenyans who come before you. We regret the, the deaths, we regret the injuries, we regret the displacement of people, we regret the fact that up to date, not all people have returned to their homes. But something is not lost in our sight. We cherish the fact that we still have our country together. We cherish the fact that the people of Kenya still speak to each other. We cherish the fact that despite of the Luo, Kikuyu, Kalenjin phrases you've had in this courtroom, the people of Kenya are still able to live together harmoniously. We do that in the distinct belief that there are men and women who put this country through the unimaginable events of 2007, 2008. One of those persons is General Mohammed Hussein. As the curtains fall on this process of the confirmation hearings, we urge you to do only three things. The first one is not to confirm these charges. The second one is not to confirm these charges. And the third one is not to confirm these charges. And we're not saying that because we believe that there will be a form of insecurity or some sort of indignation among the Kenyan people. It is the just thing to do, having listened to the evidence. Presiding Judge Ekaterina Trendafilova closed the hearing. I would like to remind the suspects to fully comply with the conditions imposed on them in the summonses to appear and to refrain from engaging in activities directly or indirectly related to the proceedings before the International Criminal Court that are likely to trigger or exacerbate tension and violence in Kenya. At this instance, the bench would like to address the citizens of Kenya, asking them to respect the life, security, and property of victims and witnesses in the two Kenya cases, and to be mindful of the fact that witnesses in these two cases have performed their civil duty to appear before this court in order to make their contribution to the task assigned to us by law. I want to assure the people of Kenya, lastly, that the judges of this chamber, Judge Hans-Peter Kau, Judge Kuno Tarfurser, and myself, Ekaterina Trendafilova, will take their decision independently and impartially, and only after having carefully examined all pieces of evidence presented by both parties so that justice will be served to everyone concerned. 
With this, the Chamber concludes the sessions of the confirmation hearing in the case of the prosecutor versus Francis Kirimi Mutaura, Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta, and Muhammad Hussein Ali. Thank you.